Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, we'll resume the extreme and variable universe session, now turning our attention more to the, the variable part of that. And for this next talk, we move from welcoming back KIPAC alumni to welcoming a future KIPAC member, um, Kevin Birch, who is currently Papalado Fellow at MIT, and he will be joining us here at Stanford as an assistant professor in the physics department. And his research is all about discovering and characterizing astrophysical sources, both of electromagnetic and gravitational radiation. And today he's going to be telling us all about discovering sources of millihertz gravitational radiation using photons from the large synoptic surveys. So uh, take it away, Kevin. All right, thanks for the great introduction. Uh, as a preface to this, I'll say this is the fourth talk I've given here in less than a year. So some of this is going to be old material for some members in the audience, but there's some new stuff sprinkled in since the last talk I gave. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm going to start here next year in June, by the way. And so if what you see excites you, come talk to me, please. Um, so yeah, what I do is I basically use electromagnetic waves to go look for sources of detectable gravitational radiation. Um, let me give a brief overview of gravitational waves for those who aren't so plugged into that community. Uh, they're basically self-propagating uh, perturbations in the space-time metric that originate from the time evolution of a quadrupole moment of a mass distribution. A really good way to get a time-evolving quadrupole moment in a mass distribution is to put two very dense objects next to each other and have them orbit around in a binary system. And so one example of such an object that we've detected in gravitational waves are merging black holes and merging neutron stars with the LIGO detectors, which operate at very high frequencies. Um, and so gravitational waves are kind of amazing because they're one of the first non-electromagnetic tools we have to study some of the most dense objects in the universe. Um, and what I'm excited about in terms of gravitational waves is actually gravitational waves in a totally different frequency band than what we're looking at right now. So millihertz gravitational waves. Uh, so there's currently detector in development, LISA, which will hopefully launch in about a decade uh, that's going to be based in space and it's sensitive to millihertz gravitational waves. So it's going to kind of revolutionize the gravitational wave world because it's operating in a totally different frequency regime. And that means totally different classes of astrophysical objects uh, that you're sensitive to. Um, one of the things that really excites me about LISA is right now, all the sources of gravitational radiation we're finding with LIGO have distances kind of measured in gigaparsecs. They're very far away. LISA is going to be sensitive to thousands of sources in the Milky Way. Um, sources uh, whose gravitational waves are unobscured by all the dust and things that often hinders us in studying things in the electromagnetic. Um, and I should say, something that I love about these things is their persistent sources. I've italicized that word. And the reason is, is if you discover some really exciting source here and decide, I need to build a new five meter UV telescope, you can do it. It's not going to emerge for thousands of years. Um, and so that I distinguish these from transients. These are not transient objects. They're persistent objects. Um, and I really like studying those. Um, let me just talk about the astrophysics a little bit. Uh, so here are kind of three different ways we have of detecting gravitational radiation. So those solid black lines kind of represent our sensitivity thresholds. I don't have time to talk about all of these, but I just want to say on the long frequency end, we have pulsar timing arrays. There have been some exciting results from those recently. On the high frequency end, we all know LIGO kind of operating up at about 100 hertz. Um, and the sources I'm going to be talking about are in the LISA band. I like to show this colorful plot just to show there's a lot of astrophysics, and it's not just the same things in all of these bands. You gain a lot by looking at different frequencies. Um, but what I am going to be focusing on are the resolvable and unresolvable galactic binaries. Um, so what are these? Uh, they're mainly white dwarfs. And so just a brief recap for those of you who aren't up to speed on white dwarfs, uh, most stars leave behind white dwarfs. They're basically the dense degenerate remnants of stars less than a few solar masses. Um, and so what's interesting is there are a lot of them and a lot of stars start out in binaries. And it turns out a lot of those binary stars leave behind binary pairs of white dwarfs. So the Milky Way is just full of these things. And a lot of them are in really close orbits. Um, to give you some physical context, these are stellar remnants. So a lot of people define compact objects as just neutron stars and black holes. White dwarfs are pretty compact. 
Um, so they're, they're about the size of rocky planets and their masses are measured in stellar masses. So yeah, the density is a bit lower than a stellar mass black hole or a neutron star, but you're still talking about a million times the density of matter we're used to here on Earth. Um, and the nice thing is, is they're sort of spherical cows uh, because we think we understand their equation of state pretty well and that it's well approximated as the degenerate Fermi gas. Um, turns out that's not always true, and I can talk a little bit more about that later. So, okay, I just told you we understand these things really well. So what makes them interesting? Like, sure, okay, they emit gravitational waves. Now I want to convince you that these things are actually really exciting to study. Uh, one of the reasons is, is with LIGO, one of the biggest questions that arose was we saw all these merging black holes of masses that we don't even quite understand. Um, and one of the questions is, how do you get two big black holes like that into a short enough orbit that they would actually merge due to the emission of gravitational radiation? Because if you start out two black holes in even like a 10-day orbit, it takes them longer than a Hubble time to merge if they're in the stellar mass range. So you have to start them out pretty close for them to even make a LIGO source. Well, the great part is, is the white dwarfs follow the same evolutionary processes that the black holes do. They also came from main sequence stars that could never fit into these short orbits. And they had to somehow end up in a short enough orbit that GR can take over and make the merger happen. And so the same mass transfer processes like common envelope evolution, stable mass transfer that people think about in the LIGO community apply to some of these systems as well, except we have tons of them and they're all over the galaxy. And so they're a really nice population to play with. Um, the other thing I'll point out is we think these things are one of the keys to understanding the physics underlying type 1a supernovae. So, I mean, I don't think I need to say it here. Type 1a supernovae have been kind of a big deal in cosmology, right? The Phillips relation was wonderful. But kind of the embarrassing secret is that even though there's consensus, certainly, that type 1a supernovae come from an exploding white dwarf, if you talk to the white dwarf community, we can't tell you why the white dwarf actually explodes most of the time, what the progenitors actually look like. Um, and it's a little disturbing. You read about the Phillips relation, and so many people say this is a remarkable empirical relation that we still don't understand the physics that's underlying it. Um, and so one of the main progenitor channels is taking two white dwarfs and merging them together to make the explosion. In contrast to there's the other channel, which we call the single degenerate channel, where you have a non-degenerate star accreting onto a white dwarf, say, close to the Chandrasekhar mass, and that causes the explosion. Um, most people in the white dwarf community think it's actually probably a mix of these two scenarios, and it's not entirely clear that the ratio of the contribution of these two progenitor scenarios has been constant over cosmic history because they have different delay times. So it's kind of nice that at least in the present Milky Way, we're going to get a really nice snapshot of the double degenerate channel and be able to compare it to the 1A rate. Um, and then the last thing I'll just say is they're also really nice to do tests of the white dwarf equation of state. They're bigger than neutron stars, which is nice because you can actually measure their radii pretty well if you get a nice eclipsing system. And you can check, is this actually behaving like a degenerate Fermi gas? Um, and it turns out some of them deviate actually quite far. They're inflated by a factor of two or three in radius when we don't think they should be. And that tells us there's something strange going on. Um, and my last pitch is I actually love the idea of merging white dwarfs because the phase space of physics that can come out of merging two white dwarfs is really rich. So think about kilonovae merging neutron stars. You get an explosion, you get maybe a black hole remnant. There's not that much diversity there. When you merge two white dwarfs, depending on what you decide to make the masses of the two white dwarfs you put in, you get this huge color-coded plot with like 15 different scenarios on it that we think might happen depending on the mass combination. It's a really rich phase space with just a huge diversity of physics that I don't have the time to talk about. Um, but the point is, is the great thing is, is we have tens of thousands of these things that we're going to be detecting in about a decade. And we can actually fill in where they are on this plot and try to make constraints about is it actually indeed that region where all the 1As are happening and we see no stably mass transferring systems, for example. Um, OK, I'm going to shift gears, though, because I have limited time. Uh, from gravitational waves to photons, so talking about actually finding these things. So the great thing is, is we don't need to wait on LISA to find them. Um, and so I did a lot of my PhD work on that little telescope there on the left, uh, which is the 48-inch uh, Samuel Ocean Schmidt telescope at Palomar Observatory. Um, it's a survey telescope that they put this wonderful large 
a digital camera on, not so unlike the big digital camera that's about to uh, go on the Rubin Observatory. It's a little bit smaller. Um, but just using this survey, it's incredibly powerful to look for these types of objects because what these surveys do is they repeatedly image the sky and give you something called a light curve. And what I do when I see a light curve is my first instinct is Fourier transform it and look for a periodic signal. And when you have binary white dwarfs, this can be pretty easy to get. For example, when one white dwarf repeatedly passes in front of the other. And so this is the trick of how you can use electromagnetic data to find those systems. And a crucial element is to have surveys with big fields of view because you do need to build up samples across the sky. You can't just take one picture and find the period, right? Um, and so what I'm really excited about is taking this survey, which is over 100 times more powerful than ZTF, and in the Southern Hemisphere, which is largely untouched for this work, and uh, expanding the searches I've done by two orders of magnitude. Um, and so, yeah, Ruben is going to transform this field, and it's going to form an Im immensely powerful complementary data set to LISA in the next decade, actually. So now you may stop me and say, wait, you just told us minute orbital periods. Um, haven't you checked the Rubin cadence? They're going to observe once every couple of days, right? You need to go back to your intro math class and learn about something called the Nyquist frequency. Um, well, it turns out this Nyquist frequency uh, comes from the fact that usually when we think about taking Fourier transforms, we think about sampling with equispace sampling. So this is our window function, which is basically a Dirac comb if you're getting a sample every delta t. And the Nyquist frequency comes from the fact that you can understand through the convolution theorem, when you take the Fourier transform of a Dirac comb, you just end up with another Dirac comb. And when you convolve that with your signal, you end up with that. Um, and so basically you're limited to the highest frequencies you're sensitive to because of this aliasing. The beauty of things like Rupin is they're randomly sampled. So now your delta functions are randomly spaced and you don't have the symmetry of that Dirac comb. And when you take the Fourier transform of it, most of those sinusoids interfere with each other and you just end up with a spike at low frequency. And when you convolve that with your signal, you don't have the aliases anymore. And so you can go to basically arbitrarily high frequencies in Fourier transforming a randomly sampled time series. This is a really underappreciated thing, but it's actually really powerful and amazing. Uh, computationally, it's expensive. So when I was at Caltech, I built a box with a bunch of GPUs to do this because you have to search enormous numbers of trial frequencies. Um, I just want to highlight GPUs have been a critical technology here because of the number of floating point operations per second they can take on. To give you an idea of how quickly the technologies advance, here's my first GPU. I bought it in middle school to play video games. Here's my most recent GPU next to my son who was born about six months ago. This is after this, the talk I gave last time. You can see the GPUs are about the size of newborns now. And that's because they can gener or they can crunch through a lot of math, but now they have a lot more heat to dissipate. Uh, they draw something like half a kilowatt now per card. And that's why they're just absolutely enormous. Um, but from a computer architecture standpoint, what's so special about them is you can kind of think of them like a CPU in some ways, but with many, many cores, which are a little bit less capable and slower than CPU cores. But when I say many, I'm talking about tens of thousands of cores. Like you can't buy an Intel CPU with tens of thousands of cores. And so they're very powerful for simple, highly parallelizable operations like matrix multiplication. And it turns out Fourier transforms basically boil down to that. Um, so now let me get at the astrophysics. So what I've been doing is using these tools to explore the space space of minute time scale periodic signals in these large data sets. And with ZTF alone, I've got something like 20,000 signals at short periods. Um, I've chosen to focus on mainly the double degenerates, so these gravitational wave sources, but there is so much other stuff in there, it's just a little overwhelming thinking about what to do with all of it. Um, but I'm gonna show you the gravitational wave sources, uh, which are near and dear to me. Uh, so in my PhD, I identified 15 of these things using ZTF. You can see their light curves here, so flux versus time. Just briefly tell you why they modulate their light periodically. On the left here, you can see a movie of an eclipsing source. So obviously, when one goes in front of the other, you get a dip in light. And that happens periodically on the orbital period. And that gives you a modulation. 
In this particular system, the little yellow star here is 50,000 Kelvin and the big blue one is much cooler. And so you actually also get a day night side effect where that hot object is irradiating the cold one, which gives you that sinusoidal modulation out of eclipse. And then you have some sources that aren't even eclipsing, but one of the objects is being tidally deformed by the gravitation of the other. And so you can actually see a uh, modulation due to seeing different cross sections of it as it orbits around. That's awesome because if you have white dwarfs with black hole or neutron star companions, you still get that signal. Those would never give you eclipses, but they can tidally deform white dwarfs. Um, and so I'll say another big part of the program is you then can get spectroscopy, measure Doppler shifts of these things and do all sorts of amazing follow-up once you've identified them with the big telescope. Um, so I kind of want to get to what we can, what cool multi-messenger science we can actually do. Like, what do we actually measure with these objects? Um, well, we have the gravitational waves. So with LISA, we'll be able to measure this deformation in space-time. Um, and I'll say the amplitude of that is related to the inclination. Um, and this amplitude prefactor that has to do with something called the chirp mass, the orbital frequency, which we already know pretty well, and the distance to the source. Conveniently, there's another polarization in gravitational waves, which LISA will actually measure both of these very well, that has a different inclination dependence. And so you can infer the inclination of the system just from the gravitational waves. Uh, but the beauty of it is the electromagnetic data is just incredibly rich. So here's a movie I have of one of the systems I discovered. This is the object. You'll see it periodically disappear. The orbital period, seven minutes. Here's the light curve in real time. That's a really information rich signal. Um, and I'm gonna explain in the next few slides all the things you can infer just by looking at that signal. And the beautiful thing is that's the signal Ruben's gonna be giving us. Um, but I also wanna add the other signal that's really information rich is if you actually look at the spectrum of the source in the optical, you can see those hydrogen absorption lines and they're moving over the course of the seven minutes. So you can also see Doppler shifts in the wavelengths of the light by taking spectra that are highly time resolved. This is challenging because these things are faint. Uh, so you're not getting a lot of photons, you're trying to disperse them and you're trying to get time resolution. So things like read noise are a really big deal uh, when you're trying to study these. Um, but let me just talk about what you can learn from just looking at the electromagnetic uh, waveform. So one thing I already mentioned, you see that sinusoidal modulation that tells you one of these objects is irradiating the other. You see a little shallow secondary eclipse, which kind of confirms that the irradiated side of that object is being transited. Um, but the beautiful thing is that remarkably deep eclipse in this source. So let me just tell you all the things you can infer just by looking at the light curve. Say you discover this in Rubin without doing any follow-up things you can read off about it. One, you know, the inclination's close to edge on. Eclipses don't happen for face-on systems. And by modeling it, you can measure it to better than a tenth of a degree, which is actually better than what the gravitational wave detector can do. Um, you can infer because that eclipse is really deep that that object that's being blocked, let's call it object one, is much hotter than object two because you're losing all of the electromagnetic flux when it's blocked. And the flux is just proportional to uh, sigma t to the fourth, basically. You can't get that from gravitational waves. They're never gonna tell you the temperatures of objects. That's kind of unique to electromagnetic radiation. Um, you can even infer that hot object number one is smaller than object number two because this eclipse goes all the way to zero, it's total. And what that means is object number two is big enough to completely occult object number one. That's another thing you're never gonna get from just gravitational waves. And using the white dwarf equation of state, you even know that smaller white dwarfs are more massive. And so object number one, since it's smaller than object number two, is also more massive. And I just wrote down inequalities here, but of course by modeling, you can actually do pretty well in parameter estimates. Um, and I'll say there's also really cool physics. If you zoom in at the bottom of the eclipse, we can just barely detect the secondary source there and estimate its temperature, which is about 5,000 Kelvin. That's surprising because state-of-the-art models for tidal dissipation of white dwarfs say we should have a 15,000 Kelvin atmosphere from just the tides alone. I don't think I need to tell anyone here that 15,000 Kelvin black bodies radiate a lot more energy than 5,000 Kelvin black bodies. So that's a huge discrepancy. And then uh, one of the issues is you have a large uncertainty there. So what you can do is you can start studying it at other wavelengths outside of the optical. So these are all optical light curves from the ground. So one thing I did was pointed HST at it, 
And it's kind of stunning to see what happens. So that irradiation vanishes. And the reason is, is uh, that secondary that's being irradiated by the hot object reprocesses that light at its own black body temperature, which is too low to reprocess it in the UV. So this gives you a really clean picture of the hot object without contamination from the colder object. Um, and then just recently, a really nice result, which I didn't show in my last talk because this data didn't exist yet, is we pointed James Webb at it. And now we detect the secondary in the eclipse quite clearly when you go out to the infrared because it's a cool object and that's the wavelength you want to be at to detect it. Um, and that actually gives really nice constraints on the tidal dissipation because now we have a rock solid temperature for it. Um, can go even further, use that eclipse and time it over time and actually measure the orbital decay of the system in the same way that was done for something like the Hulse-Taylor pulsar. That's a really cool measurement too, because what I did is I discovered the source around here, um, went back in time to old images taken by a survey called the Palomar Transient Factory and actually pieced together what the eclipse was doing a decade prior and was able to pull out this decay rate with extremely high precision. This is a really important technique for Rubin because when Lisa turns on, we'll have found a lot of them, but there will be sources we missed. Lisa will tell us the source is right there and here's the frequency. Then we go back into the 10 years or 15 years of Rubin data and pick out the orbital decay rates for free basically from that archival data. And the orbital decay is really nice because the decay depends on the gravitational wave frequency, which we already know, again, and the chirp mass. Uh, so it actually gives you for detached decaying systems a nice estimate of the chirp mass. That is really complementary to the strain the gravitational wave detector measures, the strain amplitude, because it depends on the chirp mass, the gravitational wave frequency. Well, we know both of those now. So we get the distance for free um, by measuring that decay rate. So here's this really nice complementarity when you put gravitational waves together with electromagnetic data. And you can go even further. We're timing this thing long enough now that we're starting to be sensitive to the second derivative of the orbital decay. And if it's pure GR, you can work out that it's just 11 thirds F dot over F by just taking another derivative of that expression. And the idea is by checking whether that's actually 11 thirds, you can actually just measure the tidal contribution to the angular momentum loss just by measuring whether that prefactor agrees with GR or not. Um, I should just say, just from last night, uh, here's another data point I added to the, it's still a parabola, uh, F double dot is still consistent with zero for now, but I'm confident in the next year or two we should detect it if it's consistent with GR. Um, and so yeah, I kind of want to wrap up uh, in the next few minutes, I know I still have a little bit since we started late, uh, by just showing how this has changed the landscape of known LISA sources. So the black solid curve here is kind of LISA sensitivity threshold. These were all the known systems accumulated over 40 years. Most of them were discovered as transients that outburst because they were accreting systems. Just wanna point out only two of them were eclipsing. And I hope I just convinced you the eclipsing sources are really uh, rich laboratories. Um, so this is what was added with ZTF and this isn't even up to date in just the span of like three years. So the time domain surveys are remarkably powerful for this work. I just want to emphasize a lot of them are eclipsing. There's actually a selection bias towards those sources when you look for these things in ZTF or Rubin. And I don't have time to talk about it, but there's just that each source is also like its own snowflake with its own interesting evolutionary story. They're all different. Um, the decay measurements have become routine now um, by doing follow-up with basically high-speed cameras on big telescopes. And I just want to show this is my pessimistic projection of what I'll be able to discover with Rubin using these techniques, the background sources you see there. Um, it's just an enormous explosion in the space space. And that's really exciting to me uh, to be able to do all of that before Lisa even turns on, uh, because we'll just be waiting for the gravitational waves as kind of the icing on the cake at that point. And just for those who are, want to see uh, that this is actually doable in Rubin, Here's a real ZTF light curve of that binary I just showed building up over time and its power spectrum. And what you can see is by the time you get to about 50 observations, the orbital frequency, which is about 200 cycles per day is already very apparent in the power spectrum. So this is very, very doable. Even within the first half year of Rubin, we should start seeing a lot of these sources. And so I'm very optimistic about the discovery potential. Like I say, this is not synthetic data. This is real data from ZTF that I just downsampled to the Rubin cadence.
Um, so this is not really an idealized picture. This is for real. Um, I know I'm running out of time, so I want to get to the summary slide and just say, these are really rich laboratories. Uh, the gravitational waves give you constraints on things like chirp mass, inclination, distance. I mentioned the optical spectroscopy gives you all these nice constraints on masses, rotation rates, all of these other parameters I didn't have time to discuss. The multiband light curves are really the golden thing, and that's what Ruben's going to be delivering at uh, very large scales. I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going fast right now. Um, and so I really think it's going to be unprecedented for this field to have beautiful multicolor light curves on such a large scale for so many of these sources. And I'll just say other wavelengths are also extremely interesting. And so my last slide, just to wrap up, is saying Ruben's going to transform this and that right now we're just barely scratching the surface of what's there. Um, high speed imagers on big telescopes are really useful. And I'm actually working on building one for the Magellan telescope right now. It's to get those really nice follow up light curves like the one you saw and do the parameter inference. Um, and so the one I'm working on is for the Magellan telescopes and I'm really excited to use that. Um, but in especially the era of LISA, I think the ELTs are also gonna be really important there. And Rob alluded a little bit to this too. And just to show an example, that binary I talked about, the seven minute, Here's a light curve from a five meter at Palomar, which is one of my best workhorses. Greg Hallinan, who's giving the next talk, built the instrument. Um, here's what happens when you go to a 10 meter. That's what big aperture does for you. So it is a big deal to have the big aperture telescopes to do follow up on faint sources. Um, and so, yeah, I'm gonna wrap up there and say, there's also a lot of other wavelengths that you can find these things in. Like I'm thinking about X-ray detection and so on. I don't have time to talk about all of it, but if you're interested, please come talk to me. Uh, thank you. Hey, thank you, Kevin, for that really interesting talk. And we've got time for one or two questions, I think. Uh, yes. Yep, Everett. This is very cool, and thank you for the talk. I was wondering, do you envision any challenges when working with the Ruben data? <laughs> there will be challenges. Uh, from the computational side, I think what I did that was good with CTF, I'll show you, is that I didn't have access to a cluster when I was at Caltech. So let me go back to the GPUs. Uh, I have a lot of slides. Um, this I searched all of ZTF, 2 billion sources with these four GPUs. So I was resource starved and had to figure out clever tricks on how to do this with a small scale. So I'm actually pretty optimistic because, yeah, Ruben is a lot bigger than ZTF, but it's not many orders of magnitude more in data volume. It's within two. And there's definitely more than two orders of magnitude room in terms of being able to scale up GPU resources. And actually, GPUs have become already a factor of 20 faster than these ones uh, that I was using in just a few years. So I think the computational capabilities are actually outpacing our ability to generate data faster than what we can handle. At least I'm optimistic about that. I guess as a uh, fellow fan of uh, GPU computing, uh, what would your ideal facility look like for processing the Rubin data in this way? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, so, I mean, honestly, something I found, this is just a tip to anyone who uses GPUs of the scientific grade ones like the A100s and H100s are really expensive. It turns out these like gamer grade GPUs are actually almost just as fast the, as long as you don't need to do floating point 64 operations. So my ideal thing for my algorithms would be to just get a bunch of cheap GPUs. Um, but I think the key is, is for a Rubin scale search, you want something like on the order of probably 20 or 30 modern GPUs could actually do the trick. It's not that huge of an amount to do the Fourier transforms. Now, there are other analyses you might want to do that are a bit more intense and might require more. Yeah, sounds good. And uh, Jack? Um, I was just wondering, you hinted that there are some deviations that, uh, from the white dwarf equation of state. Um, I know you don't have much time, but could you at least talk a little bit about how like L how LSST will help you figure out you know what those deviations are and what causes them? Yeah, so one of the keys to figuring out the deviations is finding them. And so LSST is gonna be really good at that. And I'll just tell you one of the deviations. So this object, that cold object, it's cold, right? So it should be close to a cold degenerate Fermi gas. Usually what causes white dwarfs to inflate out of their equation of state is they're hot. And the, 
radiation basically supports, gives some pressure that uh, puffs them up. The secondary is like twice the radius of its cold mass radius relation. And I can't really explain why other than what I think is happening in this particular case is that there was mass transfer recently. The thing expanded in response to mass loss that caused its temperature to drop, but its core is still very hot and inflated. We just can't see it because it's not in a normal equilibrium state. Um, the way you can uncover some of these things actually is you discover them, you make the measurements on the interesting sources, and then you point HFT at them to look for signatures of mass transfer history, like the presence of heavy elements in the accretor that should have sedimented out if it had been detached for a long time. So follow-up is key to kind of probing the history of the system and understanding like, is the system in equilibrium and just a weirdo, or can we explain this like strong deviation from what we expect? Um, so that's kind of in a nutshell, the sort of test you might do when you see these deviations. Excellent. Well, if there were no more questions, uh, let's thank Kevin again.